So good afternoon and welcome to Company Roots. Today we're interviewing Professor Brian Berkey, an Assistant Professor of Business Ethics and Legal Studies at the Wharton School with a focus on moral and political philosophy. Professor Berkey's work deals with moral demandingness, individual and corporation obligations of justice, and climate change ethics. Professor Berkey's research has appeared in several journals and publications such as The Mind, Philosophical Studies, and the Canadian Journal of Philosophy. It is a privilege and we are truly honored to interview you today. My name is Raul Kavuru. I'm a rising junior at St. Paul School in New Hampshire, and I'm the president of Company Roots. My name is Therese Jasti. I'm a rising freshman at the Wharton School, and I'm from Homedale, New Jersey, and I'm the founder of Company Roots. The first question that we always ask is, what were your roots, and how do they help you in shaping your ideas and becoming the person you are today? Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that's a good question. So, um, I mean, uh, sure how far you'd uh, be interested in kind of going back but uh kind of i grew up in in cleveland ohio um went to a public high school um hadn't really thought that much about um kind of exactly uh you know what i wanted to do until kind of later in high school um and ended up getting interested in philosophy went off to college and uh decided pretty early on that i wanted to um uh go to graduate school in philosophy and, and pursue an academic career. Uh, the issues just kind of gripped me and, uh, um, you know, I enjoyed being in an academic environment. I enjoy yeah. kind of thinking about complicated issues and trying to kind of work through them um, and issues in ethics and political philosophy, especially um, interested me. Um, and so, you know, went off to grad school, got a PhD and uh, ended up teaching in a business school you know, pretty much by accident. Uh, I mean, you know, n nobody is going to, you know, go and get a PhD in philosophy, uh, you know, thinking that, uh, you know, they want to teach in a business school. This is yeah. just a very unusual uh, kind of thing that uh, just kind of worked out for me. Um, you know, business schools don't hire a lot of philosophers. So the Wharton School is, is kind of unique in that respect. We have six um, professors who uh, work in philosophy, you know, did their PhD in philosophy uh, in the, the legal studies and business ethics department. Uh, and, you know, again, that's, that's quite an unusual thing uh, yeah. in business school. So that's kind of how I ended up, uh, ended up where I am. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. That's one of the things that really attracted me to uh, Wharton, that, you know, a one university policy where you have people from everywhere, yeah. um, you're allowed to take classes everywhere, but also the professors at Wharton, you know, they're from a diverse set of backgrounds. Right. Yeah. So that is a really nice thing uh, about Wharton. And it's not just, uh, you know, the legal studies and business ethics department, of which I'm a part, uh, you know, there are uh, professors who did PhDs in a wide variety of academic fields kind of across the, uh, the school, which is, uh, which is a really nice thing. Yeah. Right. So for our viewers who might not know too much about your work, um, can you please briefly explain what you do and in specifics what your what your work deals with? Yeah, so um, as you guys mentioned at the outset, uh, some of the areas of my research uh, are moral demandingness and kind of obligations of justice of different agents like individuals and corporations, uh, done some work on climate change ethics. So ethical questions of the kind that I that I deal with are questions about uh, what we should do uh, and how, what kind of society we ought to have. Um, so these are unlike the kinds of questions that are dealt with in most other academic fields um, where the aim is to, for example, describe what the world is like or predict how people will in fact behave or what will in fact happen. Um, we're interested in philosophy in normative questions. Uh, so these are kind of thought questions. What should we do, even if it's not what yeah. we're most likely to do or what we, what we most want to do or what psychological experiments or sociological research predicts we'll do. Um, so, you know, uh, to highlight kind of, um, uh, you know, an issue where this kind of comes up, I mean, the issue that kind of gripped me when I was 18 and you know, studying philosophy initially was um, this issue about moral demandingness, that is kind of how much can we, that is like those of us who are uh, 
well-off kind of, you know, uh, uh, advantaged, fortunately situated, be obligated to sacrifice in order to improve the lives of people who are, for example, uh, unjustly disadvantaged, uh, very badly off, uh, you know, people who are in danger of dying from easily preventable causes whose lives we could save by making what for us would be a fairly modest sacrifice. Uh, so this famous article by a philosopher at Princeton named Peter Singer called Famine, Affluence, and Morality. Uh, and he argued that uh, effectively every time we spend money on things that we don't need like for ourselves, right? What could plausibly be called kind of luxury purchases. Yeah. Um, not only are we doing something morally wrong, uh, we're doing something that's as morally wrong as, for example, walking away from a child right in front of us who's drowning in order to prevent our nice clothes from getting ruined. Right. So the thought is something like this. Uh, if you're walking by the pond and there's a child drowning, you could easily rescue the child, but it'll ruin your, say, nice, you know, $500 suit or something like that. Right? Uh, it would be absurd. It would be heinous to kind of walk away and say, you know, yeah, it would have been pretty easy to, to save the child, but, you know, the suit costs $500, right? Uh, I'm not yeah. going to ruin my suit in order to, to save a life. Well, um, There's good reason to think that for kind of a similar sacrifice right, by doing something like donating money to the most effective charitable organizations uh, that help people who are in danger of dying from easily preventable causes, we could effectively save a life. Right? So imagine that you know, the evidence shows that donating for every $500 that you donate to some organization uh, a child who would otherwise die ends up um, being rescued and you know, uh, can yeah. be expected to live to adulthood. Um, yeah. Well, um, then you're in a situation in which for the very same cost right, uh, as wading into the pond and ruining your suit, uh, you can achieve what seems like the same amount of moral good, saving a life. Um, so how might we deny that we're obligated to give up the $500 to the charity if, as seems obvious, we're obligated to wade into the pond, right? Could there be any morally relevant distinction uh, between these two cases? And there's been a lot of philosophical debate for 50 years now about um, whether there are any morally relevant distinctions between the cases and kind of what exactly kind of the limits of our obligations are in the charitable donation cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, from the time I was, uh, you know, 18 and kind of read the article for the first time, um, I was fairly convinced that, you know, if Singer wasn't completely right, he was at least pretty close to being right, that um, whatever the right view is about our obligations, um, Morality is just much, much more demanding than we ordinarily think it is. Um, so uh, this has been kind of in the background of most of the philosophical work that I've done. Uh, you can kind of think of the main aim of my work as kind of um, arguing that um, for a variety of reasons, we should think that uh, are kind of ordinary everyday moral standards that you know we uh, generally kind of hold people to you know don't do anything that kind of actively harms people you know don't violate certain kinds of common sense rules against you know lying and theft and things like that um, are um, too limited to represent kind of the full scope of our moral obligations. We actually have much stronger obligations to do things that will make the world a better place, that will help people, and in particular, people who are most in need. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Something I was thinking about when you were mentioning that, like, you know, thought experiment, is I think that people, people don't get that connection immediately, and they think it's kind of like hyperbole because they lack a connection to, you know, the people in need. And so Rahul and I, we, we have this organization called Just Clean Water Initiative, 
and we've mm-hmm. gone to India and worked with the people there. So we're, I, I think we're much more in touch with, you know, the people we would try to help. Whereas someone in America who's yeah. like living comfortably in a house, they think it's like, oh, you know, it's a hundred bucks. It's not going to do anything. Whereas yeah. mm-hmm. hundred bucks is 10, you know, it can be 10 water filters and that's for entire villages. So right. the connection there is something to be observed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so it does seem right that the more people are exposed to, uh, connected with uh, the needs and kind of suffering of people who, who could be helped, uh, the more motivated they'll tend to be to um, actually make some sacrifices to, um, to help those people. Um, now, uh, you know, that's kind of an empirical issue. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, that I try to kind of get my students to think about um, when I teach this kind of material in, in courses is um, whether we should think that um, it's acceptable that we tend to have this kind of pattern of reactions, right? That it's not, um, it doesn't tend to be enough to change people's behavior and their motivations just to um, come to know that there are people in these kinds of situations who could be easily helped. Right? Um, and uh, one of the difficult things is um, sometimes getting people to just kind of take the structure of the problem sufficiently seriously. So, you know, one of the things you just said is, um, you know, one of the things that people will tend to say is something like, oh, well, you know, it's just $100. It's not going to do anything. Um, And that's just to kind of avoid the problem. And this is another area where, um, you know, I try to kind of insist to my students that there are kind of independent philosophical questions that we can and should take seriously, um, regardless of um, the kinds of empirical facts. Um, Now, I mean, it is also true, I mean, there's really good evidence that even relatively small amounts of of money um, can make a significant difference for people in need. But, you know, all we need to do is kind of um, assume for the sake of argument that that's possible and ask, well, in those conditions, what would our moral obligations be, right? It doesn't refute the view that morality might be really demanding to just insist that, well, as it turns out, you know, in the actual world, you know, giving this money um, you know, we don't think would actually do that much good, right? Um, imagine some new way came about that, you know, made it the case that for every $10 you could save a life, then, you know, uh, this is what I try to get my students to think about. Then would you think you're obligated to give up all of your, all of your luxury spending? Um, yeah. And that, that brings up a good point because, you know, you're, you're, we're talking about the demandingness of morality and if people can't handle it, then, you know, essentially you're saying, what, can, what else can you do if they can't handle it? Mm-hmm. And so I guess something where you're making an impact is you're teaching people that, you know, you can, you can like handle the demand and you're, you know, kind of increasing the amount they can handle by raising the questions earlier on. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the idea, right? I mean, the more you get people to think about these issues and you know take them seriously and understand the reasons why the moral questions can kind of in principle be separated out from some of these other kinds of questions um you know i think the more you help people develop the right kinds of critical thinking skills to kind of identify the morally relevant features of different cases and to question the ways that we might kind of initially uh, be inclined to respond to cases that uh, actually share a lot of morally relevant features, um, even though we might kind of tend to respond to them very differently, at least initially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you received a BA in philosophy and politics, summa cum laude, 
and an MA in Humanities and Social Thought from NYU, as well as a PhD from the UC Berkeley. So how has this education helped shape your teaching and decision-making um, in the classroom? Yeah, um, so uh, much of my uh, focus in my education was on you know, philosophy, political theory, um, these sorts of things. I was lucky enough to um, you know, go to a couple of really great universities where the, the philosophical community was um, you know, really active, um, both among the faculty and, and students. Um, uh, so unlike at um, some other uh, universities, even very good universities, um, philosophy was a very popular major um, both when I was an undergrad myself at NYU um, and uh, when I was a graduate student teaching a lot of these students um, at Berkeley. Um, Berkeley was a unique and, and really nice place to, to do a PhD and to, and to get some of my first teaching experience because um, the range of students and in particular kind of in the philosophy department, the different backgrounds and kind of what students were interested in and kind of um, where they were coming from uh, really made the kind of classroom discussions um, in some ways really kind of easy to facilitate because the students had a lot to say and they were kind of uh, very willing to kind of engage with each other. Um, and so, you know, I had to kind of learn to, um, manage discussions where you know kind of a whole lot of people wanted to be speaking at once so you know the challenge for me wasn't like how do i get students to talk you know do i have to cold call people or things like this um uh but the opposite right how do i kind of manage uh a, a discussion when there's always you know 10 or 12 people trying to uh to get in um but you know a little bit more about the student population at Berkeley. You know Berkeley and the, the whole UC system has this kind of arrangement with um, the community colleges in California, and so we got a lot of community college transfer students at Berkeley. Many of them were older, um, so you know when I was 23, 24, um, you know TAing the first couple of years in grad school, I had a lot of students who were older than me uh, who you know. Kind of went back to community college later and transferred to Berkeley and had really fascinating life stories. Um, you know, some of them had been in the military and others of them, uh, you know, just had been working in various industries. Um, you know, for people who had kind of dropped out of high school, they grew up in areas where, you know, high school graduation rates were really low and the public education was generally, um, you know, not, not that great. Uh, and then kind of ended up, uh, you know, going back to school later in life and, you know, having students with those kinds of backgrounds in the classroom really um, helped generate really interesting and kind of thoughtful discussions about, you know, the kinds of issues that we were just talking about and kind of the range of other things that uh, were covered in the, in the philosophy courses that I taught there. Yeah. Um. You did a fellowship at Stanford and Harvard as well. What were, mm -hmm. what were some, of take, some of your takeaways from those? Yeah, so um, yeah, I spent a couple of years at the Ethics Center at Stanford before I moved to Wharton. Um, great experience. Uh, so uh, there are a few universities that have these kind of um, usually interdisciplinary ethics centers um, where um, and there's kind of a mix of philosophers and kind of people from some other disciplines who work on kind of adjacent issues that have some kind of normative component to them. Um, when I was at Stanford, um, we had, I think my first year there, we had eight postdocs uh, who were all kind of there at the same time. These are people who had recently finished their PhDs, um, were kind of working on related issues. There were several of us there who were working on climate change ethics issues. Um, and you know, people working on kind of issues about justice um, more generally. And uh, one of the really nice things about that was, uh, you know, surrounded by people kind of at the same career stage, thinking about similar issues. We had kind of a weekly um, 
meeting where somebody would circulate a paper and then we would talk about it. Um, and, you know, it was in my time there that I um, both you know, was able to take some of the work that I'd done in my dissertation and turn it into uh, journal articles and then develop some kind of new uh, lines of work uh, on some issues in climate change uh, and then um, issues about um, uh, obligations of justice beyond what I had talked about in my dissertation, which was kind of just a more general theoretical defense of the view that individuals are directly subject to the principles of justice. Yeah. Right. So at Wharton, some of the past classes you have taught include ethics and social responsibility, international business ethics, and even seminar in law and society. So personally, was there a personal favorite class that you have taught? Um, and if so, can you describe some of your experiences you had with your students and also um, what the material and subject matter you taught? Yeah, so um, yeah, I've taught a few different classes at Wharton. Uh, the one that I've done the most is kind of a gen general introduction to business ethics. Um, it's a lot of fun to teach. It covers kind of a range of issues from kind of um, you know, theoretical approaches in business ethics. I do a little bit on uh, kind of obligations of aid, which is the, the kind of demanding this issue that I, that I talked about. I, you know, I teach the Peter Singer paper that I'd mentioned that you know, I'd read back when I was 18. Um, the students are generally really good. Um, I make my classes heavily discussion focused. So, um, you know, the students are expected to come in kind of having read the material. I kind of open the, the class by saying a little bit about the day's readings. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of ask for uh, student comments, questions. Uh, we spend most of the time just kind of, uh, you know, hearing student reactions to the arguments and we kind of try and talk through, uh, you know, what uh, we might think about whatever the, the kind of issue is that, um, you know, is kind of our central focus for the day. Um, what, you know, one of the things that makes that class pretty enjoyable to teach is, um, you know, you get to cover a range of really engaging issues that students tend to uh, have a lot to say about. So, you know, we talk about advertising ethics, we talk about um, the ethics of companies employing people in sweatshop conditions around the world. Um, you know, this past uh, semester when I taught, I did um, a little bit on the ethics of the treatment of animals in business, which was an issue that I hadn't included on the syllabus before, but um, you know, I'd written a paper about it recently, and so um, you know, I thought it was uh, you know an issue that would uh, that is both really important and would uh, would generate some some interest and, and good discussion among the students. Um, yeah. Apart from that class, I teach a class on international business ethics, which is kind of an upper level elective. Um, where the focus is primarily on kind of a range of issues having to do with global economic justice and kind of the practice of business in a global context. So, you know, talk about things like trade justice, um, spend a couple of weeks on climate change, um, uh, bribery and corruption in international business, these kinds of issues. Um, so that's kind of, those are some examples of, of uh, um, the issues that kind of get covered in the, in the courses that I teach. Um, looks a little bit different than, uh, you know, I think the typical uh, business school course. Um, but, you know, I think um, one of the things that, that at least many of the students appreciate is that, um, you know, it's, it's one of the few courses in the curriculum where, um, you know, there really is kind of a sustained focus on uh, the ethical dimensions of, uh, of the issues. And we kind of take the issues up from a normative perspective rather than just kind of thinking about, um, uh, you know, um, what will maximize profits or, uh, you know, um, uh, what we can expect people to actually do in these different situations. Yeah. Yeah. Something that, uh, that I found cool was it's a lot of discussion based, I guess. Um, and you, you know, you take articles and you read it and then you discuss them. So personally, when I was trying to learn about, you know, 
how everything works, I would just read books and mm-hmm. you know find articles online and then read from there and figure it out. And then sometimes I would bring it to my teachers in high school and then they would hold discussions. And oh, um, my yeah. high school is not, not too diverse. So a lot of people would be more or less in agreement. Mm-hmm. But some of my friends, they would come up to me after class and they're like, that article was kind of crazy. And <laughs> have like random discussions about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this sort of thing, um, you know, I think is really important um, in the course of an education. Uh, I mean, you know, I look back at my time in, in college and, uh, you know, I definitely think a lot of the courses that I took were really valuable and of course getting to engage with professors who are, you know, kind of leading figures in the field is, is really great. But um, I mean, I definitely feel like I, I got almost as much out of just kind of late night conversations with, you know, a few friends about, you know, things that had come up in class or just other kind of issues that, um, you know, were kind of interesting to us as, you know, philosophy students. So, um, uh, you know, uh, I was fortunate that um, when I was a student, there was this kind of culture of, um, you know, taking the time to do that sort of thing, you know, just sit around for five or six hours and kind of talk about complicated issues and figure out what to think. And, um, you know, this is one of the things that, I mean, to be frank, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see more of at a place like Wharton where, um, to a large extent, the, the culture is, is a little bit more kind of driven by, um, you know, the sort of professional development goals that students have, you know, they spend a lot of time, you know, going to club meetings and doing things to get on their resume. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of pressure around these things. And so, you know, I don't really hear stories from students about, you know, ah, you know, me and my friends were, you know, up all night on Saturday arguing about, uh, you know, moral demandingness in the way that, you know, uh, when I was teaching at Berkeley, um, you know, I definitely, uh, you know, would hear a lot more of that, you know, when I showed up to, uh, uh, you know, to a class on, on a Monday or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, that's, as a teacher, I feel like that would be unique and kind of wonderful. Mm-hmm. So, oh, you can go wrong. So, I watched your interview on YouTube, which um, was called "Talking Philosophy and Business Ethics," where in one section you felt that the business world um, still has a lot of work to do and complete to to meet the climate change issues. So, for students who are trying to make a difference in this field, what advice would you give them when when working through this challenge? Yeah, it's a really uh, it's a really good question. It's a hard question. Um, climate change is a big problem with, in some ways, a unique structure. Um, It's both a global problem and an intergenerational problem. And one of the things that this means is that uh, in a world where, of course, you know, future generations are entirely unrepresented, they can't kind of advocate for their interests, they don't exist yet. Um, And in which there's so much global inequality, where the people and the countries that are um, most responsible for continued high levels of emissions uh, are in many cases not the ones that um, are likely to suffer the most from climate change. Um, It's very difficult to see how an adequate solution to the climate problem can arise without people in and countries in positions of power and advantage being willing to make genuine sacrifices, uh, at least in the short term, uh, in order to move us on a path toward um, successfully addressing the issue. Uh, And I think this is part of the explanation for why we've seen, frankly, so little progress in the 30 or so years since the first IPCC report, since it became you know, kind of overwhelmingly clear that this was a serious problem that, uh, that we really needed to do something about. Uh, and so there's an unavoidable role for ethics and moral argument here. Um, you know, it is true that um, 
renewable energy is slowly becoming more kind of cost competitive with fossil fuels and so on. But, you know, this is, uh, you know, the most important dimension of, of the problem, though not the only one, right? So animal agriculture is also a big issue and, you know, connects up these issues about climate change with issues about animal welfare. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I kind of try to get my students to think seriously about when I um, talk about climate change in, in class is that um, we can't assume that there's some solution to the problem that doesn't involve us being willing to make some pretty radical changes to the ways that we live uh, that might involve some real sacrifices. Um, so, um, you know, of course, new technological developments in the energy sector and elsewhere that might be helpful would be great. Um, that, you know, has to be part of kind of any plan to, um, you know, reduce emissions in the long run. But uh, we can't adopt an approach to the climate change problem that involves kind of assuming that we can, for example, just innovate our way out of it without having to make any sacrifices. Yeah. Um, you know, um, it, we haven't seen any, you know, uh, any innovations yet that, you know, um, are significant enough to allow us to do that. And there's at the very least no guarantee that we will see anything like that in the next even 20 or 30 years. Um, and that means that if we're, going to avoid really disastrous effects, um, we have to make serious changes in the absence of, you know, being able to necessarily maintain every aspect of our current lifestyles that, um, you know, that, that we've become accustomed to. Yeah. Um, and that brings me to a different question. Um, what do you think is the big ethical question of this generation? And how do you think people grapple with that? in your experience? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, it's not clear to me that it really makes sense to say that there's one central ethical question for your generation. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing recently um, are some of the ways in which what have for a long time been thought of as separate or at least kind of separable questions really are quite deeply connected. So, you know, for, um, you know, a number of years uh, since the financial crisis of 08, there's been increased talk about inequality, talk about, uh, you know, the extent to which, um, you know, people in your generation are having to kind of take on a lot of student debt in order to get an education and then find themselves graduating with more limited opportunities than people in previous generations have had. Uh, I mean, that's only going to be worse now, of course, because of the pandemic. Um, but of course, we're also seeing, um, you know, an increased focus recently on issues of racial justice, policing, um, Climate change is, of course, a huge issue. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned a bit ago, you know, climate change um, is connected in at least uh, a couple of important ways to issues about animal suffering, um, which I think, you know, for a long time uh, has been um, underemphasized in discussions of the most important ethical issues that we face. So um, we face a wide, range of issues, um, there are reasons, I think, to be optimistic um, about the, uh, at least, desire among younger people to really face up to some of these issues in ways that previous generations haven't. Um, you know, I think certainly that's true to a large extent on some of the racial justice issues. It's true on climate change. Uh, it's even true on uh, the animal ethics issues, I think. Um, um, my sense is that, um, you know, people around your age are, are kind of more willing to 
um, take those kinds of issues seriously than, uh, you know, a lot of people even, you know, around my age um, uh, have been. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, when we're facing so many very large issues, um, you know, it's going to require a lot of commitment and a lot of motivation to, um, you know, to, to take them all on. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of an open question uh, to what extent you know, yeah. uh, we'll actually see, um, you know, real progress on, on the full range of these issues. Something that I, I saw was, um, I don't know if you've ever watched Hassan Minaj, but mm -hmm. he, uh, he, was doing, he was talking about uh, compassion empathy, where we're facing so many issues that people might just stop caring for most yeah. of them. You know, so just like some people just really spearhead their focus on one thing and try yeah. to get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, this raises a difficult question of strategy in some sense, right? Um, I mean, uh, you know, you can imagine kind of thinking about this on kind of an analogy with um, economic theory, right? So there are kind of advantages to, you know, a division of labor. Um, so you might think, well, you know, if there are some people who work on climate change and other people who work on racial justice and other people who work on animal issues, then maybe like the combination of all of that will kind of move things in the right direction. And, you know, maybe it's not such a big deal if, um, uh, you know, Indivi at the individual level, people, you know, end up kind of caring in particular about one issue and, you know, not really focusing on or thinking that much about the others. Um, mm -hmm. But there are also reasons to worry about that, right? Because um, in politics in particular, um, you know, there's often, I mean, just kind of see this, um, you know, um, among groups of people who you'd ordinarily think of as, you know, kind of falling roughly on the same side of the political spectrum, kind of end up getting into kind of big fights with each other about, you know, what should be prioritized and, uh, you know, um, uh, this can limit the possibility for productive collaborations and productive discussions that are necessary to kind of work through the issues and, you know, make progress in kind of determining exactly kind of where we should go and kind of what the core values are that should, um, that should move us forward. And it's also, you know, uh, problematic if you get a kind of fragmentation and hostility among people who really kind of agree on a lot of things and, you know, uh, really should be working together to promote uh, their sort of common aims. So um, I do worry quite a bit about um, a kind of model of political activism where people focus exclusively on kind of one issue and, you know, don't really even kind of engage um, intellectually with the kind of full range of, of questions and, um, you know, try and kind of um, work through their own thinking about kind of the full range of issues in a way that um, uh, would better facilitate collaboration among people who really do have largely kind of shared goals that would be better promoted collaboratively than, you know, with people working in, in kind of silos on separate issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also like in terms of like moving forward and potentially making an impact together and um, collaborating on um, this kind of relates to our last question and final question. Um, what advice would you give to the current generation of high school students that would like to start the process to make an impact on society? And then how would you recommend they start this process? So, I mean, I'm gonna give an answer that, you know, will kind of, um, uh, you know, reflect my kind of disciplinary commitments and, you know, um, promote kind of the importance of the kind of philosophical reflection that, you know, that, that I do. Um, I think that uh, a really important first step 
in putting oneself in a position to make a positive difference in the world is being willing to put the time in to think carefully about uh, exactly what uh, the values should be that should drive our action, right? So, um, you know, I think the kind of advice that a lot of people are inclined to give students, um, you know, who are thinking about these things, you know, something like, you know, follow your passion, um, you know, do what, you know, most motivates you, what you're most passionate about is in some ways quite misguided advice. Um, we need to take the time to think through not what we already care about, but what we really should care about. Um, and uh, that requires facing up to questions like the one that I talked about initially, right? Uh, well, if you think that it would be horribly wrong, as we all do, to walk away from the drowning child, um, should, should we also think, or must we also think, that it's just as wrong to refuse to, uh, you know, say, donate money rather than spending it on luxury goods for yourself. Um, because if someone like Singer is right, then there are real questions to be raised about somebody who says, well, you know, my passion is, um, you know, uh, trying to, you know, improve the lives of, you know, people in my community, which maybe is already, you know, full of people who are pretty well off in some, you know, relatively narrow way, you know, um, that engages my interest. Well, you know, that might be um, kind of, in one sense, a good thing to do. It might make the world a better place in some, you know, very small way, but there are opportunity costs, right? Um, you know, if instead of doing that, one could have done something that, you know, would have saved the lives of a lot of people in, you know, a far away part of the world, um, and that is actually much more important, um, that's something that, you know, we need to think about before we decide on a course of action. Uh, and, you know, being in high school, being in college, I mean, that is, the time when people, I think, really should be devoting um, a good deal of attention to thinking carefully through these issues, um, and you know, you know, doing things like I described a little bit ago. You know, spending you know, a, you know, five or six hours on a on a Saturday night, just kind of you know, talking with friends about you know these sorts of complicated but really important issues. Well, thank you for letting us interview you today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, great. Uh, well, yeah, it was great talking to you guys. I'm glad to, you know, be able to offer a little bit different perspective on things. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Thank so you much. for your time. Yeah, Have a good day. Right. Talk to you later.